thank you all for the opportunity to discuss sex in survivorship, a proactive approach to sexual health. In today's talk, I'll focus mostly on sexual health in females who experience cancer, although many of the general approaches can be applicable across all sexes. I have no financial disclosures. There's a reason that we chose this topic for the presentation today, because 59% of female cancer survivors will experience a direct effect on their sexual organs. So this is a prevalent and pertinent topic. While studies suggest that patients want information about sexual function after cancer and rate sexuality and sexual wellness as a high priority in survivorship, they rarely receive this information. In fact, less than 20% of female or male cancer survivors sought care for their sexual health, although studies suggest that 50% say they would seek help if it was accessible and affordable. So why aren't discussions about sexual health happening between clinicians and patients? There are multiple factors that create barriers to these conversations. From the patient perspective, this could include embarrassment or feeling guilt for wanting sexual wellness. And we also know that the majority of patients want their clinicians to initiate the discussions. Clinician barriers to these conversations can include lack of time, training, and a referral network to guide patients through sexual health conversations. The clinician may also think it's another clinician's role. Maybe the oncologist assumes that the patient's primary care physician or OBGYN is tackling this topic, or assume that the patient will bring it up if they want to talk about it. Clinicians could also have personal discomfort discussing sex. There's also the contrast of sex and cancer itself. Sex and sexuality is associated with reproductive health, life, pleasure, and joy, while cancer can be associated with death, destruction, loneliness, and loss. So part of our roles as clinicians and patients and advocates is to work to break down some of the misconceptions about sexual health in survivorship. A common misconception is that sex is a luxury one cannot afford in the fight for survival, and that sex and sexuality is not possible or might be dangerous in a body that's experienced cancer. There's also a misconception that partial loss or change in sexual function means it's all lost. And part of that misconception is the idea that intercourse and sexuality or sensuality are identical when they're not. We have to work to change the misconception that having intercourse or being a sexual being must define one's identity as an individual or within a partnership. If we look at the impact of cancer or really any disease process on sexual function, we can define multiple areas of impact. There can be the threat of disease itself, how it changes sexual organs directly or indirectly, and the visible body changes that can happen after treatment and surgeries. There can also be the change to mobility and changes in the ways that nerves and muscles necessary for sexual fun function respond. Because of medications, surgeries, or treatments, there can be changes in hormone levels that impact sexual health, and there can be associated symptoms that may not be a direct effect of treatments themselves, but are consequences over time, like genitourinary syndrome of menopause, also known as GSM, which we will discuss more later, or the loss of control of urinary function. All of the main impacts on female sexual health can be attributed to genitourinary syndrome of menopause in some way. We used to refer to this as vaginal atrophy, 50% of all postmenopausal women will experience GSM, but this can be accelerated by medications or surgeries that induce menopause as part of a cancer treatment. Estimates show that 70% of females who experience breast cancer develop genitourinary syndrome of menopause. This is because many of these females are on adjuvant endocrine therapies for longer durations, like selective estrogen receptor modulators or CIRMs, or aromatase inhibitors, or AIs. Despite these staggering numbers, only 50% of patients ever seek treatment for this condition that induces a plethora of symptoms, all of which are due to a loss of estrogen that leads to physical changes in the genitourinary syndrome, which is the labia, the clitoris, the vagina, the bladder, and the urethra. GSM results in changes in the genital tissue that can cause dryness, burning, and irritation. 
This causes a lack of lubrication, resulting in painful sex and impaired sexual function. Because the bladder and urethral skin are impacted, this can also cause urinary urgency, painful urination, and recurrent UTIs. Clearly, if only 50% of patients are seeking treatment for intrusive symptoms like GSM, then we as healthcare professionals are under-recognizing and under-treating sexual health in our patients experiencing cancer. So what can we do differently? We as patients and clinicians can adopt a three-step approach on improving sexual health outcomes. We need to dis discuss sexual health before and after the active treatment phase, address sexual health throughout survivorship, and it's not enough just to talk, we need to offer treatment. Let's consider what goes into this conversation. We need to start with the background of each patient's experience. What pre-existing factors may exist, including pre-existing sexual dysfunction? We'll take into consideration the specifics of the cancer treatment and each individual's response, coping, and resilience. We have to have a very candid discussion about sexual health concerns. Is it pain, loss of sensation, changes in orgasm, interpersonal challenges with partners or self? This often is a conversation that can include a partner or partners, but sexual health concerns can and do arise without partnerships as well. All of these details will then allow us to develop a patient-specific treatment plan. Part of the first steps are to define the sexual health outcomes that are important to you as the patient. We need to work to answer these questions. Are we trying to reestablish pre-existing sexual health? Or maybe there were concerns before and we need to find a new reality and a new normal. We need to help determine what can be changed, what's realistic and what's part of the acceptance process. Changes, unknowns can and will cause anxiety. This will impact sexual health. We need to anticipate these barriers to change and how motivated are who are involved are to make these changes. Changes in function without distress don't have to be distress, don't have to be addressed. So when we're developing a plan, we'll first work to answer all of those questions. The plan's really gonna be specific on what each person needs, but there are some frameworks that will apply to most. Education about sexual health, treatment options, and expected outcomes are all normal. This involves looking at other medical conditions and looking at a patient's medication list. For example, having uncontrolled high blood pressure or diabetes will affect sexual health. So how can we work to improve these outcomes as well? Medications unrelated to cancer treatments can have negative effects on sexual health, and we often have options to change these. We must look at the psychologic and mental health components of sexual health. 75% of sexual function is impacted by the psyche in some way. We'll discuss sex therapy more in a few moments. For most patients, topical lidocaine can be an option to help with pain with internal vaginal sex. Often dilators are prescribed after surgery to help maintain structure or help prevent scarring or stenosis, which is narrowing of the vaginal canal. Pelvic floor physical therapy is another critical component to sexual health and survivorship. I'll mention more about this in a few moments. Regular sexual activity can get patients into a place of comfort. That can be important in maintaining function and blood flow. And yes, this includes masturbation and vibrator use. I wanna take a moment to describe a bit more about vaginal moisturizers and lubricants because I have a lot of patients ask about the difference between these two. So some moisturizer options. So moisturizers are hydration for the vagina. Just like someone would moisturize any other part of the body, the vagina is no different, except that it does require a different moisturizer that you would use in other parts of the body. These are all available over the counter without a prescription, and there's a lot of different options. I have not one that is my favorite, not one that I would endorse more than the other. So I'll talk about what some things are you could consider when selecting a moisturizer. There's some characteristics that are worth looking into. The optimum pH, which is the acidity of the moisturizer, is between the levels of 3.5 and 4.5. All moisturizers have something called an osmolality. That's the concentration of the particles in the moisturizer. We're looking to moisture for moisturizers that have a similar osmolality to the vaginal tissue. This creates the best environment for hydration. So you wanna look for an osmolality 
between about 380 and 1200. This is information that you would more be more likely to find online, but sometimes it's printed on the bottle. Depending on personal sensitivity of the skin, one may want to avoid parabens, glycerin, and propylene glycol that could be irritating to vaginal tissue. An important reminder is that these are all available online and at the um, store at the pharmacy, but moisturizers and, and lubricants don't treat the genitourinary syndrome of menopause that occurs either with menopause or after certain cancer treatments. So although these products are great options for providing moisture to the skin, they don't replenish the estrogen barrier that gets lost. And here's a few that you could become familiar with. Liquid silk, replens, refresh, liquid organics, sink, aron sense, and yes. So lubricants are different. Lubricants are used with internal vaginal sex. Two main classes are water-based and silicone-based lubricants. They're both safe to use with latex condoms. Some may have heard of oil-based lubricants like avocado oil, coconut oil. I would not recommend these because these can cause an increase in vaginal bacterial growth and can impair condom effectiveness. So water-based lubricants need to be reapplied over time and, and with extended stimulation. So if you're using a water-based lubricant, you're going to need to apply it multiple times, most likely during sexual intercourse. With silicone-based lubricants, this could not be a great choice if a person has a male partner who has erectile dysfunction. And water-based and, and silicone-based lubricants can be used for any type of penetrative sex, including anal sex. So let's talk a little bit more about sex therapy. Sex therapy can be a really important part of sexual health. This can include behavioral therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, and mindfulness-based cognitive behavioral therapy. So behavioral therapy attempts to alleviate sexual difficulties through a combination of techniques. This can include education, communication skills training, and sensate focus exercises. Cognitive behavioral therapy challenges unrealistic beliefs that could be contributing to sexual problems. It has been shown to reduce symptom severity and to a lesser degree improve sexual satisfaction among females with low sexual desire. Mindfulness exercises include exercises that aim to cultivate presence, moment awareness, and non-judgmental observation of experiences. Mindfulness can help decrease distraction during sexual activity and increase awareness of pleasurable sensations. Mindfulness-based cognitive behavioral therapy and mindfulness-based techniques can be done outside of a professional therapeutic relationship. There are lots of wonderful apps that can be used in order to practice mindfulness. Two of my favorites are Oak, O-A-K, like the oak tree, and Calm, C-A-L-M. If somebody is looking for a certified sex therapist, I would highly recommend looking at the AASECT website, American Association of Sexuality Educators, Counselors, and Therapists. These are individuals who have had certification and additional training in sex therapy. Another really important part of sexual health is the health of the pelvic floor. Pelvic floor physical therapists may be the most important person to a female who has experienced cancer. Pelvic floor physical therapists can work to strengthen and relax pelvic floor muscles and increase muscle awareness through biofeedback. They can also help when patients have urinary and rectal incontinence or help patients with dilators. Pelvic floor physical therapies are really a critical team member when it comes to treating painful sex. They can also treat lymphedema related to cancer treatments and surgeries, and physical therapists can help with neck and back pain after mastectomy. We know that chronic pain can be a barrier to sexual function, and treating all of these elements can be important. Despite trying all of these first-line therapies, some patients will continue to have persistent genitourinary syndrome of menopause symptoms or other symptoms. Taking into account those individual patient factors, including the type of cancer a person experienced, shared decision-making between a patient and their clinicians, and after consultation with their oncologist, especially for patients with a history of breast cancer, oftentimes patients could benefit from vaginal hormone treatments like local vaginal estrogen or DHEA 
or aspemethine, which is an oral medication. And there, this is really where patients and physicians will weigh the risks, the benefits, and the evidence of local vaginal hormone treatments. To be clear, vaginal hormone treatments to treat genital urinary syndrome of menopause or painful sex, this is very different than systemic hormone therapy, where a patient might take an oral estrogen or wear an estrogen patch. With local vaginal hormone therapy, very little hormones gets into the bloodstream. There may be differences in risk based on carrying genetic mutations, estrogen receptor positive breast cancer, triple negative breast cancer, or females with a low risk of recurrence of cancer. So if you and your clinician is considering a local hormone therapy for vaginal treatment, estradiol comes in a ring, cream, gel, and capsule. Presterone or DHEA is a precursor. It's converted to estrogens and androgens in the vagina. Aspemaphim is an oral tablet in a class of medications called selective estrogen receptor modulators. These are all effective in helping genital urinary syndrome of menopause and painful sex. There are no studies that have compared these head to head to determine a best. Since they have not been directly studied in breast cancer survivors, conversations about the use of these in patients who have experienced specifically breast cancer is really based on that patient level information and shared decision making about risk and quality of life. Other considerations are what a patient might prefer as the vehicle for getting this treatment in and on their body, cost and insurance coverage, and what applicator type may be more comfortable. I wanted to end with a brief discussion about vaginal laser. There's a lot of marketing directly to consumers and patients around vaginal lasers with some marketing promising a new vagina. The best advice on vaginal lasers as it stands right now comes from two organizations that look at the science and evidence in female sexual health, the North American Menopause Society and the International Society of the Study of Women's Health. The bottom line about vaginal lasers is that we don't know the long-term safety and effectiveness at treating genital urinary syndrome of menopause or painful sex in any patient population. While lasers have been FDA cleared, they are not FDA approved for the treatment of GSM or painful sex. But we hope to have more studies and research that support these as non-hormonal treatment options moving forward. This concludes the presentation component of our time today. And now we will open the discussion for questions. Thank you.